Well, since this is a small room, I think I might do this a little differently. First of all, can you hear me or should I be mic? Happy to turn it on. You're good? All right, cool. We'll go without it. Um, I'm curious, why, what brings you to this room? What, what is it about the presentation that, that uh, I've already talked with Eric and Keith, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from, from you all. Okay. Yep. Cool. Voice recognition. Okay. How about you? <laughs> Real time voice and rails. Okay. Have do you have any experience, or have you ever tried to do it, or just a sort of general curiosity? Okay. Okay. How about you? Okay. Sweet. That's two. Okay. Sounds good. How about you? Oh, nice. All right. Well, then, I guess as you already know, the uh, the subject what I'm talking about really is going to focus on WebRTC. So, other than this guy, uh, who's heard of it? Anyone heard of WebRTC? Sort of? Yeah, I know you did. Okay. <coughs> um, so video killed the telephone start. Uh, a little bit about, about my background. Um, so I'm from Atlanta. And I, my background is telephony. So I built custom applications for telephone systems. The kind of thing where, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to admit, like those IVRs you hate, we didn't do those. We did other ones very similar but much better. And I'm the leader of an open source project called Adhesion. If you're familiar with Rails, you can think of Adhesion as Rails for telephones. So the kind of thing, it's a framework for building applications you can call in, do speech recognition, uh, you know, DTMF, keypad input, that kind of thing. Um, but obviously, telephones are great and all, but nobody really likes using telephones, even me. So um, we, uh, we've been getting, and I'm sorry, one more thing. This is my company, Mojolingo. We're based here in Atlanta and uh, have people all over the world. And we, we actually build these applications, both on the telephone and then in the web. So uh, the talk is about WebRTC, and it's kind of in three parts. The first part is an overview of what WebRTC is. The second part is a bit about how WebRTC works. And the third part is all about use cases. So uh, some ideas about how you can use voice and video in your applications, which hopefully will spur some curiosity and uh, creativity of your own. So I'll start with what WebRTC is. Uh, for most people, WebRTC is the JavaScript API that allows you to access the camera and the microphone in the browser. So every laptop just about that ships today has a camera and a microphone built in, but until WebRTC, there was no way to actually access it without something like Flash or Java, which is kind of a pain, right? Because plugins suck, and they, uh, they aren't available on mobile, and they tend to eat a lot of CPU power. So to solve this problem, Google and Mozilla and Ericsson and Microsoft, a bunch of other companies got together and defined a standard accessible through JavaScript to access the camera microphone. That's what most people know about WebRTC, if they know anything. Uh, but what WebRTC also has built in mandatory high quality video and audio codecs. So I'm talking about Opus. If you're a codec geek, you might know what that is. Opus, uh, you might. Dolby? Yeah. Okay, so um, Opus is music grade audio. Um, you can use it to, and it's, you can use it to send very high definition audio, but it will also degrade gracefully. So if you're on a bandwidth constrained connection, you'll still get intelligible voice through. It's, we, we saw a demo yesterday, at actually another conference in Orlando. They had 50% packet loss, which means for every packet of audio sent, one of them was dropped, and the audio was still perfectly intelligible. Opus is amazing technology. So that's the audio side. On the video side, we have two different codecs, H.264 and VP8. Uh, 264 is an industry standard for high quality video. Uh, VP8 is Google's contribution. They actually bought a company and then uh, essentially released all the intellectual property as open source. It's called VP8. And you'll actually see it. VP8 and its successor, VP9, are starting to become visible on like YouTube. That's how they encode the videos. But they, they include the same encoders into the browser so we can use high definition video streamed from, from any browser. It also has a bunch of techniques for getting through NAT. If you're not familiar with NAT, uh, every links is firewall or whatever you have at home to get through the internet, all of your computers and your local network have private IPs that are not directly reachable from the outside. Well, when you're sending video and voice across the internet, generally it's best to, send, to make direct connections wherever possible. So if I'm in Atlanta and you're in Connecticut, uh, we don't want to go through a server in San Francisco to have our conversation. Because what will happen is we'll add all of that delay 
going back to San Francisco and back. And it just makes the conversation more awkward. So WebRTC tries to make everything peer-to-peer, -peer, but the problem is now you've got firewalls. WebRTC has a bunch of mechanisms, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, that help uh, get communication established even through a firewall. What, one of the big design goals of WebRTC was to be peer-to-peer. -peer. So again, we're, whenever possible, we try to make direct connections between WebRTC browsers. And if, if uh, that's not possible, for some reason, we have fallbacks. Another thing that's often overlooked is a data channel. So once we have a connection between browsers, we can actually use not just send voice and video, but arbitrary data. It could be JSON, it could be image data, it could be text, chat, it could be anything. And this is actually one of the interesting applications uh, in the IoT and M2M space, is WebRTC is being used as a transport for getting data from devices uh, to other clients. The last thing I want to say about what WebRTC is, it is primarily a tool for developers. It's not something that most people will uh, you can't buy it. You can't install it. It's it's a JavaScript API, right? So for most people who interact with it, it will be because someone has taken it and built something with it. And so you might you might not even realize you're using WebRTC, right? If you use Google Hangouts, you've used WebRTC. Uh, so it, it tends to kind of be one layer beneath the surface. I'll also talk about what WebRTC is not. So as I, as I mentioned, it is not a polished and user-ready product. You can't go buy a WebRTC phone, right? It's just a, a piece that's that's added. It's also not the same thing to every application. I kind of talked about M2M and IoT. Uh, there are interesting applications of the technologies or parts of the technologies of WebRTC that have nothing to do with video conferencing. So I talked about uh, being able to send data across devices. There's actually a content delivery network and a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service built using the networking parts of WebRTC. And then I've even, even seen some interesting applications that use just the uh, camera, without sending the video anywhere, use just the camera in the browser and then do things like uh, use JavaScript to put overlays on the video or to, uh, you know, make you look like a cartoon or whatever the case may be. So there's a bunch of little building blocks you can use for other stuff. Another thing I'll mention is, and this is kind of comes from my telephony side, but it's not required to interoperate with anything else. It's entirely possible that you'll have a WebRTC application that is in a silo on this site and that's totally fine. There may be other WebRTC applications where, say, I'm on Facebook and I want to talk to somebody on Twitter. As long as Facebook and Twitter have a way to communicate, we can set up the call. But that's not really required. There are some use cases for that, and there are ways to solve that, but it's, it's not necessary. And the last thing I should mention about WebRTC is it's not actually finished. It's a draft specification. It's very close to 1.0. We expect that to go this year. Um, and it's already stable, has been stable for a long time in Firefox and in Chrome. Um, but it is, so basically, don't sweat it. This, this is a, uh, just to kind of underscore that point just a little bit, this is a chart by an industry analyst called Dean Bubbly. And um, besides using uh, kind of boring colors, he has projected that we are right about 3.5 billion WebRTC-enabled devices on the planet today. So again, that's Chrome and Firefox primarily, but it's also every recent Android device, as well as a number of other devices that have it built in or applications that have it. Um, and it's expected to reach six and a half billion by 2019. So there's a there's a very large audience already available, which is why I say don't worry too much about it. And I do have to kind of treat the elephant in the room, which is that um, Internet Explorer and Safari don't support WebRTC yet, but that's a temporary thing. First of all, uh, Internet Explorer in particular already has implemented some of the building blocks, it's just not available in a released version yet, and. Uh, Apple, who's notoriously quiet about what they want to do, hasn't said much, but one of their developers has been committing code uh, to Safari's open source components that uh, hint WebRTC is coming. In the short term, though, there is a plugin that you can get from a company called Temesis, and it will enable both Internet Explorer and Safari to have uh, WebRTC support. It, it's a, and it's fully standards compliant, so you don't have to port the code or anything. Um, the plugin is free for private use, and there's a license for commercial use. But it's a good option if you um, if you are forced to support those browsers. All right, so that's what it is and isn't. I want to talk about how it works. And I'll talk first about the this communication topology. So as, as I mentioned, my background is telephones. And this is kind of the model that most of us are used to when we think about communicating. So Alice on one end, she's a subscriber of AT&T. If she wants to call Bob, she types in Bob's phone number. That signal goes to AT&T. AT&T looks in its master database and says, well, that number resides on Verizon. 
and sends the call to Verizon. Verizon says, well, I know that subscriber. His phone is sitting over here and delivers the call. This is, I was talking earlier about interop. This is an example of a federated architecture, different service providers providing service. Um, you can do this with WebRTC, but most people don't. And it's called the trapezoid for what's hopefully obvious reasons. Another one that we're familiar with is called the triangle. So Skype is a good example of this. Now, in this case, we only have one central authority that manages Skype usernames. Uh, and then we have Alice and Bob who are each using their Skype client. When they want to make a call, they simply connect to that username, and it goes the signaling, which is the, hey, I want to make a call, and the media, which is the actual audio or video. All of that goes through Skype. So it's sort of like a two-legged triangle. WebRTC, I like to call it a more perfect triangle. Because again, the idea is that you send your signaling in through a, through a central server. Basically, it allows people to locate each other. But ultimately, the intent is for the media to pass directly between the browsers. And this is really great because if, for example, you're stuck behind a firewall, you might just have HTTP to set up your session, right? That goes pretty easily through firewalls. Media often doesn't, um, especially if you're on a slow link. Well, the nice thing is the, the application might be out on the public internet, but your video and audio never leave your local network. So no matter how congested your internet link might be, you can still enjoy a high, high quality conversation. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, I also want to talk about sort of some of the pieces, what it looks like if you deploy a WebRTC application. So we'll start with a couple of users. We've got a Firefox user and a, I think that's a Samsung Edge, I think. The first thing we have to do is we have to get them to talk to each other. And that action is, is signaling. Technically, this is all you need for WebRTC. All you need are endpoints that support the standard, and you need a server in the middle to facilitate the communication between them to set up the signal, right? So uh, Firefox wants to call the phone, or the phone wants to call, fire, call Firefox. That's all you need. The problem is that we live on the internet, and there are firewalls. And that makes it hard for the audio to get directly across. In most cases, that's solvable with a piece of network equipment called a stun or turn server. There are open source implementations of turn servers. There are commercial implementations of turn servers. Uh, you can even rent turn servers, sort of EC2 style. Um, but this is the minimum configuration I would recommend if you plan to deploy an application to the public internet. Because almost certainly, some of your users will be behind firewalls. Now, as you start to grow and you start to get more users, and especially if you want to enable conference calling that has, say, more than four or five people, um, with WebRTC's default, you're sending a copy of the video. If I'm talking to you, and you, and you, and you, and you, each of you are getting a full copy of my video stream. As you can imagine, that can eat up a lot of internet bandwidth, right? Because you're sending a full frame to every user and audio. What these two pieces of kit do, either an SFU, which stands for Selective Forwarding Unit, or an MCU, which stands for Multi-Party Conference, um, Multi-Point Control Unit, you can stream the, the audio and video to it. It then will uh, rebroadcast it to the other participants. And there's some technical differences between the two, which are not particularly important right now. Um, but they're two different styles for solving the same problem. There are, again, open source implementations of both SFUs and MCUs. For an SFU, Jitsi Video Bridge is pretty well known. Uh, for MCU, you can use something like FreeSwitch or uh, uh, Corento Media Server will do it. And the last piece is a media server. So. WebRTC being essentially client-side technology, it doesn't make it very easy to do recording or to, say, uh, inject recording. You know, if you want to play a recorded file to a, a WebRTC listener, if you want to play video to him, um, you need something like a media server. For, uh, again, for open source implementations, you can use something like Asterisk or FreeSwitch. Uh, and there are commercial ones as well, many, many, many commercial options. So not every WebRTC deployment looks like this. I realize there's a lot of lines and boxes on the screen. Uh, like I said, the two top things are the most important. That's kind of your minimum internet deployment. If, if you have more advanced use cases, you might need these things in the bottom. There's also good news, which is that there are lots of commercial services that will kind of bundle those things up for you. So they, uh, these are just a handful of, I think, the most well-known, Twilio, Respoke, TalkBox, Candy, and even AT&T has a pretty interesting WebRTC program. Now, these vary in their capabilities. In particular, AT&T or Twilio and Twilio are interesting because not only do they facilitate browser-to-browser -browser communication, they'll also gateway the traffic. So you can actually make phone calls from your browser, which can be interesting. There are a lot of call center use cases for that. Um, personally, I, I think uh, that 
taking a really nice piece of technology like a mobile phone or a browser and making it a telephone is a bad idea, but there are people who need to do it for various reasons. Um, but these other ones, they add the recording, they add a bunch of other things as well. All right, I've, I've kind of hinted at signaling. I want to talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So the first thing to say about it is it can be anything you like. Kind of the most common signaling you get is a very simple web service. And it can be as simple as I want to post my offer, which contains my invitation to have a WebRTC session, to a web server. That web server can sit there and be polled looking for updates or can use WebSocket to distribute it more uh, real time. Has anyone here heard of SIP? You know what SIP is? Yeah? Okay. So SIP is Session Initiation Protocol, which is a terrible name for what it actually is. This is the standard way of doing voice over IP. It's, uh, if you're doing voice over IP, 99.9% .9 chance you're using SIP to get that done. So WebRTC can be used within existing SIP infrastructure as well if you have that. Another one's XMPP. Does anyone know what that is? Yep, exactly. It used to be known as Jabber. Cisco actually bought the trademark to that name, so now it's XMPP, which is way cooler sounding, right? Um, extensible nesting and presence protocol. XMPP has a functionality for setting up calls as well, and so you can use uh, those, uh, those facilities to set up WebRTC calls. And the last one, I kid you not, you can do it with a carrier pigeon. All you have to do is print out the uh, offer and on a piece of paper and stick in a carrier pigeon. He flies down the street or to the next city. Uh, the person at the end types, <laughs> very carefully, types all that back in. Uh, but it will work. You can actually establish a session. And my point, besides making a sort of funny joke, is that the signaling is very simplistic. There's not a lot of magic to it. It's really just getting the, the coordinating pieces to either end. And you can use any technology you like to do that. So select your signaling based on your application requirements. You know, if you're, if you're using one of those companies I mentioned earlier, they will generally take care of the signaling for you. If you happen to be a company that already uses XMPP or SIP, use that. If you're a web developer and want to stick with the tools you know, feel free to use a web server, um, which is what I just said. Uh, there's also the question to federate or not if there's a need. Most WebRTC applications I've seen don't require much federation, which is to say company A being able to call company B with WebRTC. In the few cases where they do, generally there's a telephone gateway to get that done. So WebRTC becomes just a front end of the telephone system. But there may be some use cases for that in the future. And the last thing to think about is what kind of identity are you trying to achieve with this? Are, are, is this an anonymous use case? Do you want to reuse social identities like Facebook or Twitter? Or is there a requirement to have some kind of legal uh, identity? So I've talked a lot about how WebRTC gets set up. I want to this will kind of step us through the process. The first thing that happens is Alice sends an offer. And this offer contains all of the contact details, the network connection details uh, on how to be reached. And she says, I want to reach Bob. So the web server, in some way, shape, or form, gets that back to Bob. Bob comes back with a bit of his own information, his own SDP, which contains his contact information, as well as the capabilities he has. Can I do audio? Can I do video? And how can I do audio and video? And once they do that, a whole bunch of packets start flooding out over the internet connection. And this is called a, a mechanism called ICE, Internet Connectivity Establishment. Um, the ICE uses another thing called STUN. There's no logo for these things. I had to make this up. Uh, and turn, which is a relay service. So this is pretty cool. This is how we get through all those crazy firewalls on the internet. And I, is that readable? It was pretty good, all right? All right, cool. Um, this is what an ICE session looks like. So what you're actually seeing is every, all of these ones that say host, down the left side here, each of those is an IP address directly attached to my computer. Now, my computer's weird because I have two different types of you know, VMware and VirtualBox, and I have VPN connectors and a whole bunch of other stuff, and IPv6. Um, but each of these addresses is directly connected to my computer. That's important because WebRTC will actually try to use every single connection available to it in reaching the other partner, which means if I have a LAN connection and a VPN connection, the LAN connection is closer, it'll take that. If I have a VPN connection and an internet connection, it'll take the VPN connection if that's closer. It's pretty cool stuff. If that doesn't work for some reason, we have these two fallbacks at the bottom. SRFOX is server reflexive, which means that's the IP address I appear to be on the internet generally. So if we can, we'll just kind of fire packets at each other's firewalls and hope it works, which sometimes it does. And if that doesn't work, the very last fallback is this, these two relay lines. And this is turn. This is actually a turn server. So what this is saying is I have a server out there who has offered to relay my traffic for me. 
So if all of these other options don't work, my fallback is I'll send my audio and video to a third party who will turn around and send it to the other guy and vice versa. And generally speaking, one of these things will work. Yeah? So if you're, if you're at home, you know, running this kind of thing, you expect to see like other address like, you know, one nine two one three like yeah. You, you won't, I mean, hopefully you won't see it because the user doesn't care. Right, right. But it's like your boss will be like, I'm right. Right. You know, right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you talk about 192.168, these IPs here, 172.20, those are all in the same category of IP addresses. They're called CIDR. Um, they're all in that range. And then these down here, these are actually public IPs. So you're right. If, it, when I was doing this, I was actually testing two tabs on the same machine. They just went over the, the same network card. But you've got the right idea. It'll, yeah, yeah. Which doesn't show up in the, in the uh, output because it's not too useful outside of that. Okay, so ICE gets us connected somehow. Once it does that, um, then we move on to the next step. And which is to actually start sending the media to each other. Now the cool thing about this is SRTP, the S stands for secure. Just like HTTPS is secure HTTP, SRTP is secure RTP or secure media. By default, uh, WebRTC requires endpoints to send encrypted media, which is awesome because we have things like the NSA and they like to listen in on things, so we stop them. But also stops other things, you know, uh, anyone, anyone listening on your calls, whether it's fraud or whatever. Uh, the nice thing is privacy out of the box. All right, so that's technically how it works. I want to move on a little bit to talk about some thoughts for designing WebRTC applications. So I've been talking and I've been building WebRTC applications for about two and a half years and thinking and, and talking a lot about it. And I came up with five tenets that I feel like are important considerations if you're going to build some kind of communications application. So the first thing is it should be adaptive, which is the property of being able to take advantage of the capabilities of the various devices you may be running on. Uh, it should be fluid, which means that if I start on one device and move to another, or if I start with lots of bandwidth and move to less, the, the application should adjust accordingly. It should be contextual, which is really my favorite point. It should take advantage of the context the user has. If you're at work, your application knows who you are. It knows who your peers are. Uh, it knows um, the work you want to get done, you should add that context to the application. Otherwise, it's just a, another telephone. It has to be trustworthy, uh, obviously. If users don't trust it, they won't use it. And it should be referenceable. So I'll go a little bit more in detail on each of those five things. Um, adaptive is the property of taking advantage of the capabilities of a device. In this case, we have a woman using Firefox. Firefox, being a modern web browser, pretty much has all of the possibilities available. We have video, audio, uh, input and output, and we have text input. So it's very common to see WebRTC deployed alongside some kind of chat application, right? It just makes sense. If we're talking and I want to send you a link, rather than spell it out, uh, just paste it to you. Much easier. Maybe I'm on an iPad. Now, iPad, I mentioned Safari does not support WebRTC. However, you can get WebRTC SDKs that you can compile into native apps. So native apps can be WebRTC endpoints as well. And they're pretty full-featured. Now this person is on kind of a feature phone, and they have a couple things available. Uh, she has a couple things. She has audio input and output, as you might expect, and some kind of limited text input. But in this, in an adaptive application, if, if she can call into some kind of conference bridge, she can still participate at an audio level, or maybe see a copy of the chat messages, even if she doesn't have the full, uh, full participation that the others have. And we got some poor guy stuck on a really old looking phone. He's pretty much got audio, and that's it. Maybe he's on the road, maybe he's in a spot where there's no data, but at least he can still call in and participate. And then, just as another example, we've got this guy here who has Chrome, um, and he has audio, but for some reason he has his mic turned off. Maybe he's muted because of background noise, maybe he uh, doesn't uh, want to talk because there's someone sleeping in the room, I don't know. Um, but the application, he can still participate by listening and maybe even being seen, but then send his responses via text. So that's the quality of being adaptive. Next one is being fluid. So this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, you guys have all used Skype, right? Kind of assume that? OK. So a lot of times in Skype, I start my communication with a text chat. Then I'll upgrade, I'll click a button and add audio. Uh, then I'll add a couple more people to the conversation. We still want it. We need more people to discuss the item at hand. Maybe we'll upgrade to video. 
But at some point, we're going to be done, and nobody wants to stay on video forever. So then we'll downgrade back to chat. And the other thing I really like that Skype does really well is I can switch devices and keep going. When I leave my desk, that same conversation goes with me. And if I want to rejoin through audio or video, I can do that from my mobile phone. So fluid, uh, being fluid is a really cool and important design consideration. All right, this is my favorite one, contextual. But I have a friend who works with Ericsson and AT&T out in Palo Alto. Uh, Jeff, do you know Jeff Hollingworth? Do you really? Oh, cool. All right. Um, so he has, this, he has this saying, communicating isn't going to be what you'll be doing. It's what you'll be doing while you're doing something else. So it's this idea that today, communication is, is kind of tied to your phone, right? If you, if you think about talking to somebody, if you're communicating with them in real time, you're probably going to reach for your phone or maybe an instant messenger. Whatever it is, it's happening out of the context of what it is you're trying to get done. So the idea that communications becomes a feature and we start to bake it in to these applications we're building, that's pretty cool. So being contextual, you want to think about what information you have about the user and include it in the application. So in the middle of our video chat, um, I might have a button to add my manager to this call. And knows my manager is because the application understands the structure of my organization. Or maybe it shows me how many sales reps are still out in homes, or how much we've sold so far, or how many callers are waiting to, to be handled, or just even when the next available appointment is. I'm probably trying to solve one of these problems, and the communications is the way by which I do it. Should be trustworthy. Um, my favorite one is just don't surprise the user. Don't do anything you haven't told them to expect. Uh, don't do anything that, that will um, by, just violate their expectations of your, of your service. Another one is kind of important, and it probably obvious, user data stays the property of the user. If there were two people party to that conversation, those two people should have access to it, uh, but others should not. Kind of obvious. This one I think is more nuanced. Help make smart choices where required, but with sane defaults. So a good example of this is um, Firefox and Chrome remember when you visit websites, they remember which sites you've been to and which ones you've granted access to the camera microphone. So you don't have to reprompt every time, which would be pretty annoying on a app you use day to day. But if you go to a site you've never been to before, it prompts you again. So that's a good sane default, right? It generally does what the user needs, it expects it to do without burdening them. Um, but also gives them the control over their privacy so they don't feel like they're on a limb. And I'll just touch on identity. I actually have a talk I do all about identity. Um, Identity is an interesting thing because most of us have more than one. We're not just a, a single phone number. We're not just a single email address. I have you know, at least two, one for my personal life, one for my home life. Uh, and identity is often intrinsically tied to communication. Who am I talking to? Who's on the other end? If you assert identity, which is to say if the application purports to be some person, rather than being something kind of arbitrary, like a phone number is a, a great example. 10 random digits assigned to me when I was old enough to buy a cell phone. That is not a friendly address. But if you assert identity, it should be easy to tell that the person on the other end is who I expect it to be, and it's, you know, maybe it's my Twitter handle, maybe it's my Facebook profile. Um, but just think about how identity ties into the communication you're building. And the last tenet is it should be referenceable. So again, we live in the age of the web, right? We have the ability to make everything shareable. Every interaction we have, if it makes sense to record it, make that, give that recording a URL and be able to share it. So every conversation should have a URL that's permanent and unique. It should represent the latest state of the communication or the request. So what I mean by that is, if I have a conference call, before the call, I generally know who's been invited. I know what time it's scheduled for. If I go to the address at that time, or before that time, I should see this conference call is coming up. Here's who's going to be there. While the communication is ongoing, then I should have the tools to interact with the communication. Uh, ideally, WebRTC, I can just join the communication by simply hitting the URL. And then after the communication has occurred, have a reference to it. So maybe it's, um, it may contain uh, a recording, it may contain a transcription, uh, or even annotations taken during the, you, the audio conference associated with it. Especially great if it's searchable and downloadable, because we can generate a lot of really hard to find data very quickly this way. Uh, and it should be shared, but of course, don't forget to respect the privacy limits that are, that are expected. Yeah. Yes. Like, I 
It is much easier to record. So I'll repeat the question for the recording, so I forgot they're doing that. Uh, the question is, what are the laws around recording, and, and what does it take to sufficiently advise the user he's being recorded, that kind of thing? So I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> block that. Um, so I strongly suspect this is a case of the laws have not kept up with the technology. I can speak a little bit more to the telephone side, because I have some experience with that. In the United States, some states are one-party consent, which means only one party has to say, it's cool if this is being recorded. The other party doesn't even have to know. Some states are two-party consent. In practice, everybody calls across state lines. In practice, everything is treated as two-party consent. Um, how that applies to WebRTC is, a, I don't know. I, I, if it were me, I would probably not build something that didn't at least follow that. You know, if something's being recorded, then... Um, then let everybody know that this is being recorded. And most, most applications do. So for example, uh, there's a conferencing service called um, Uber Conference. And when you call in, you can just get a little blurb, this conference call is being recorded, right? Just like you said. And that, that pretty much checks the box. Because at that point, the user can say, well, I don't want to be recorded. Hang on. Um, of course, you, you, there, are, there are limits to that. A friend of mine is notorious for recording every call with a very low-tech solution of putting a recording device next to a speakerphone. But that's not something an application necessarily can account for, right? Does that answer it best I can? Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult to know. OK, so those are the tenants. Now I'll get to the idea part. So these, this is three ideas I've had. This is hardly, this scratches the surface of what's possible, I think, with this technology. But I like it because I think it makes some of the, uh, what we've been talking about, more concrete. So the first one is a job interview application. So something that has context and facilitates uh, interviewing candidates who are remote, people who are not necessarily physically in the office. This is important to me because my entire team is remote. Every person we've hired over the last five years has been in, um, if not in the same city, sometimes in another state or another country. So job interviews have to happen you know, over phone or Skype or whatever. This, OK, by the way, all these ideas don't exist in the real world. This is just my imagination. But if any of you would make them, let me know, because I would probably buy it. OK, so this job interview application. This is a pretty simple one. Uh, you can kind of see that during the interview, what we've got is we've got a video conversation with the interviewee, uh, who happens to be my, my lovely, lovely wife, acting as a model here. Um, we have this, uh, her resume. So I can see what she's done. And I can see it while I'm talking to her. I don't have to you know, go find it in my email, whatever. It's, it's, Put right up in there. And of course, there's a text box where we can send links and references back and forth. Now, this is as the conversation is in progress. If we rewind just a little bit and look at how we got here, when I posted the job uh, listing, right, it, it, she clicked the link. It takes her to my, to my site. She's able to create an account. She can uh, upload her resume or any other reference material she might want me to see. And then most importantly, she can see the blocks of time I have set aside for interviews and pick one. Because, man, if that's not the hardest thing about interviewing candidates is just getting everybody who needs to be on that call at the same time. Because it's just a bunch of emails. Silly. So you get that. Um, and then any, I, I didn't put a box in it for it here, but the idea would also be to have notes for me as the interviewer that I can keep track. Because if I do 15 interviews in a day, which is exhausting, I have a lot of notes and it's hard to remember who is who. But if I put it in here, you know, I've got a recording and conversation, I've got resume, and I've got my notes as well as the chat transcript. So. Um, just to kind of recap on that, self-service, the candidate signs up and uploads their own resume, or I can do it on their behalf if that's necessary. Easy scheduling for the time of the interview. Oh, you don't have to exchange phone numbers or Skype names, or kind of go through that dance of, you have Skype, or I'm not on Skype, I'm on wire, or what are you, you know, or what are you on? By the way, I don't do phone interviews anymore because the audio is so terrible. I can't stand it. That's a whole different talk. Um, contextual interviews. So you get text chat alongside the video conversation. You can see the resume next to the candidate. And then you can track and save the notes of the interview. Um, and then record and share interviewee responses. One of the things that came up sort of recently is um, my, my CTO wasn't available to be on an interview. So I had the interview. And I wanted to just send him excerpts from it to get his reaction. But I couldn't really easily do that, right? Uh, so it would be cool to be able to record it and just excerpt from it and say, hey, check, check him out at you know, minute 310 and see, see what you think. All right, that's the first one. The second one is an instant response app. So before I got into telephony, I was a systems administrator. So I dealt with data centers full of servers that were just always breaking, because servers break. And very often, they would break at un inconvenient times of the day. And very often, we would have to get multiple people involved to resolve the issue. So something that would be really cool 
is to have an incident response app, an app devoted to the purpose of uh, responding to these server outages. So the, the kind of key parts to this are the voice and video. Obviously, whoever's in the conversation, I can chat with them, and we can we can text chat and send links, whatever. Kind of covered that. But in this case, the context is what else is going on in the network. So we have integrated the monitoring applications. You can kind of see connectivity on the left. You can see bandwidth users in the middle, and then disk and memory on the right. Um, I don't know how many times the server's gone down just because the disk filled up. All the things trying to go down. What's kind of not immediately obvious is that this is an ad hoc team, right? If if I'm the first responder and I come in and say server's down and it's a database server, the next person I'm going to grab is the database guy, right? And in in my organization, I can you know I can look through the, the list of DBAs and I can grab that person, pull them into the chat. Now the next thing that happens is DBA says, well, we've got a support contract with Oracle; they need to be involved in this. Now I can email the Oracle rep, uh, the support rep, a link, and that Oracle rep can join this directly. Doesn't have to be a part of my organization. We can offer guest credentials. No client to download. He doesn't have to go download the WebEx client to see what we're talking about. He just joins right in. That's pretty cool. So in the incident response, the most important thing is timely and contextual information, which you get the context and you can see the history over time. Um, the other thing you can do is you can adapt for mobile versus desktop. So yeah, we might be in front of our desktops most of the time, but there may be somebody who's on the road and joining in from the phone and can, can kind of see some of the same information. I really like the, the group-based communication aspect. So we can inherit from the existing groups in the organization. I can say, click a button and invite all the DBAs, and whoever's available can respond in that regard. Allow ad hoc participants, like I said, the vendor who wants to send some kind of support rep in. And I didn't mention this, I, I got right past, but federate with external services. So if you're familiar with GitHub, or you're familiar with New Relic, or other services like this, you know when you push code, you can have a webhook? We'll have that webhook push into the text chat. So as we're chatting and trying to resolve the issue, and some developer is uh, still committing and deploying code, we go, oh, it's down because he just deployed bad code. Now that trigger is right in context with the people trying to solve the problem. So there's a lot of opportunity to bring in external context. Obviously, everything should be recorded and logged, mostly because we want to do lessons learned afterward, right? If we start seeing the same problem over and over, how did we solve that? Come back six months later, maybe even integrate it with our ticket tracking system, so that if a lot of the tickets get open with a similar description, we can actually go to where the solution was. Okay, the last one, medical records and patient services. Um, get this question a lot. We have uh, we have a lot of inquiries from companies who work in some facet of the medical industry who are very interested in communication and how it can be enabled. Um, and obviously one of the big things they worry about is security and privacy. So when you call your bank and or your or you call your doctor and they ask for your date of birth and your last name, not the most secure method of authentication I can think of. Kind of weak. However, when you log into the website, that's fairly strong, right? You've probably gone through an enrollment process. Um, you might have even done it in person at the doctor's office, but you have a username and password that's unique to you. So in this case, um, I logged in, and I went to my electronic medical record dashboard. And I can see every time I had a visit with a doctor, I can see uh, the notes that the doctor took. I can uh, listen to a recording if, the, if he left audio notes for me. And then if I have a question, I can actually click a button right here and talk to an on-call doctor. What's cool about that is it already, I've already gone through the strong authentication process. It's, it's, a, it's clear that I, sh I should be who I say I am. Um, and then the phone actually launches right in the browser and reaches out to the physician on call, wherever, wherever that person is. So medical advice, secure call authentication, I think that's really the key win here. Um, you'll reuse the uh, primary authentication via the website. If you want to and you're really crazy about it, you can use voice biometrics, which is, you know, hello, I'm, what's his name, Warner something, my voice is my passport. Can I get the reference? Yeah. yeah. Sneakers? Verify. Verify me? Yeah. Sorry, I'm a geek. All right. Um, Cross-check against call locations. So we've got browser, we've come from an IP address. Where is this person? If the request is coming from Nigeria, it might not be me unless I'm traveling. You also use this to automate a lot of things, medical claims for one thing. We have a recording and possibly a transcription of all of the interactions the patient has with the doctor. We can also track the medical advice given to the patient and add it to the patient file. So if I talk to a different on-call doctor in the future, there's very little confusion. I don't have to remember with my non-medical memory what the advice was. 
And you have relatively easy auditing and service quality assurance. So we can go back over time and look at the kind of recommendations doctors made and, and actually listen to how they delivered them. Which brings me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is WebRTC and Rails. So I, I kind of asked this earlier, but who here, Rails developer? Rails developers? Two? And the rest of you? Well, you're a Rails developer, right? Three? OK. So I'm a Ruby guy. I talked about adheres in the, the framework for voice applications. That's a Ruby language framework. We also really like WebRTC, and we really like open source. And we wanted to create something that would make it a lot easier for people to get started with WebRTC purely open source. So we created this thing called Talking Stick. Um, Talking Stick is, so I have a screenshot of it. Um, I really should have told the guys I was screenshotting this. <laughs> this is just one of our stand-ups. Um, oh, you're not on there, Keith. Yeah. So Ben's actually living in Brazil right now, and it was really hot where he was. Um, and Brian's in Spain. And Harry's in Colorado. But anyway, we actually use this tool. We, this is how we do our, our daily stand-ups with the team. Everybody just comes in, does their little, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? What are you doing? Where are, we, are you blocked? Um, and it's really easy to build. So I will show you, uh, this is the repo on GitHub. So this is, it's delivered as a Rails engine. All you have to do is mount it. And um, it has a couple views you can scaffold in. There's a database migration to keep track of some signals. But it's really pretty simple to install. Now, it's really, I want to emphasize it's a starting point. Like I said, if you're deploying on the internet, you do need some kind of stun or turn server. And if you're, if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk more about where you can find those pieces. Um, but it's, it's a relatively small amount of code, so you can kind of see how the pieces fit together. You can see how we implemented HTTP polling. It's, it's built in a Rails app and using kind of least common denominator. You know, I couldn't expect WebSockets to be available or um, and I couldn't expect long polling to work if you had multiple nodes, so we just use HTTP polling. But it's all very pluggable. So the signaling layer is actually a single JavaScript file, which you can simply replace with whatever you choose, whether that's um, XMPP or SIP or, or whatever else. Um, if you would like, do you have laptops? A couple of you? Uh, we have time, so I'm going to do something rather dangerous. And uh, we can try it. And this may or may not work, because it's beta code. But if you want to go to talkingstick.io, go to try it now, create a room for ConnectJS. And I'll put my name in here. So you all should be able to go. It's uh, talkingstick.io slash room slash connect dash JS, or you can just get to it from the home page. And um, if we're lucky and the demo gods are smiling on us, then this will work beautifully. Oh. Anybody having luck getting in? Internet issues? Yeah. Conference Wi Fi. Sorry? Oh, okay, yeah. Conference Wi Fi is the single biggest enemy of successful demos, I'm convinced. Yes. By the way, if you have an Android device, feel free to try that as well. Yes. That's a good question. It's um, not an easy one to answer. So the the, st the statement I think is that uh, the nice thing about the telephone is you pick it up and it always works, and that that's true. Um, it, you know, technology as it moves, people take time to upgrade and, and become compatible. It's never an easy thing. Um, like I said, the, the chart I had earlier that showed the number of WebRT devices available, that, that speaks partly to it. The fact that IE and Safari don't have it yet is a real factor. 
Um, I do believe all the indications are that this will be a standard part of browsers in the, in the near future of all browsers. And I, I, I'm optimistic that we will reach the point where, you know, we don't, I don't worry too much about Skype work anymore. I worry about somebody not having Skype, right? Um, with WebRTC, the, the problem of somebody not having it largely goes away, hopefully. Um, and if the technology is done right, and there's a lot of money, uh, Google's invested quite a bit in making this work. So I'm optimistic. I feel like it's a, I think it'll be all right. Hey, we got one. And it works. Oh, your name. Yeah. Congratulations, you're being broadcast. Oh, no, it's on the wrong screen. You don't even get to see it. Oh, um, you may be recorded for quality assurance purposes. Hey, look at that. Oh yeah, I should be quiet. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, don't do that. Could be bad. All right, so that's talking stick. Um, feel free to applaud. That was rather impressive, I think. Yes, thank you, thank you. Oh yeah, no, you're too kind. You're too kind. Please, um, I'll put the I'll put the GitHub link up there. Dot com, mojo, lingo, thick. So this is the engine that you plug in. There are instructions for how to install it down here. Um, the other thing that may be interesting to you is the app you just saw is itself open source. It's called Talking Stick Demo. It's also available under Mojo Lingo. And uh, has the views are a little nicer because it's the actual Rails app rather than just kind of the, the guts of it. Um, yeah. So that's it. I'll put these links up real quick. If you want to learn more um, about WebRTC generally, the WebRTC.org web team does a great job with their samples, that it, which are on GitHub. Uh, and then their website is WebRTC.org. If you want to learn more about voice, specifically with Ruby, check out TalkingStick.io, which you just did, or Adhesion, which is the framework more, for, it's more oriented toward telephony, but we're expanding it to do some more WebRTC things as well. Um, and yeah, with that, if you have any questions I haven't answered yet, I would love to take them. Yes, so Internet Explorer today, 10 and below, do not support WebRTC. Internet Explorer 11 will support WebRTC. Um, <clears throat> again, WebRTC has several components. The most common ones are Get User Media and RTC Peer Connection. Those are the names of the JavaScript APIs. Um, I believe it supports both of those today. One kind of wrinkle, uh, you know how Microsoft loves to kind of do its own thing? They're kind of doing their own thing with the right way, though. I'll say this. They're doing it the right way. They're trying to uh, push through what will probably become WebRTC 1.1. Um, and it's called ORTC, but it's really the same thing. It's just uh, an uh, evolution of it. So they are supporting ORTC, but have committed to releasing uh, uh, basically shims that will be backward compatible with 1.0. So um, yes, but it's not quite there yet. And it's, it would only be in, I think they call it Edge now, whatever the, their new browser. Their new browser. Yep. yep. Any other questions? So your statement was, it sounds like in a lot of cases you've got an app that may or may not already do communication, but you want to add voice right. video to it. Yeah. To me, that's the biggest value. Yes, you can certainly go build the next Skype, right. but without having a 150 million users or whatever they have, it's kind of a questionable utility. But all of us work on some interesting or important project, and there's probably some aspect of that project that would benefit from communication. The beauty of WebRTC is being a web technology, it's relatively easy to embed within it. So, yeah, I, I think that a lot of the growth of WebRTC will come from places that don't traditionally think about communication as a feature, because previously it wasn't easy to, in, to integrate. So, from that perspective, you're talking about, like, the, the stuff and the current service, it's like, you know, the more of that stuff that you release, the more as a developer or, like, a company, it's like, oh, it's not working. Right. Like, so, for something like Twilio or the phone, you can back it up. That's kind of what you're looking for, is when you're like, oh, it's got the context. You know, like, the medical feeling was perfect. Like, as far 
Right. right. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So the more infrastructure you have to roll out certainly is a burden to a adopting the technology. And and you're also right that the vendors who make that easy, like Twilio and Respoke and others, um, <clears throat> that's that's a big part of the cell, right? Like it's we go get your API key, plug it in, here's a bit of JavaScript, done. And and that, that's great. And a lot of apps are being built that way. I reference the other pieces both to to explain, but also to let you know that this is very much from the open source. The, all of these are open standards. Every if if you if your application grows to a point where it becomes necessary that you deploy your own infrastructure, you can certainly do so. And there are open source implementations that are production ready, well tested to support you. But if you're just wanting to kind of put your toe in the water, um, you know, Talking Stick, if you're working on a LAN, will work fine with none of that. Just a local rail server or, or even a Heroku rail, ser rail server. Um, and if you're wanting to do something a bit bigger, then certainly check out you know any of those for Spoke, uh, Twilio, Talkbox, Candy, AT and T. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your activity and your. Thank you.